Mr. President. Senator from South Dakota. Mr. President, um, a lot of our colleagues on the other side have come to the floor today and, and uh, talked about why they don't like uh, our tax reform bill. Uh, many of those arguments have been focused on who benefits from it. And, uh, you know, of course, as is usually the case um, when you start talking about any kind of a, an attempt to reduce taxes on the American people so that they can keep more of what they earn, keep more of the dollars in their pockets so they can decide how to spend it rather than send it to Washington, D.C., uh, Democrats complain that it is tax cuts for the rich. Well, again, I want to point out, and this, of course, is based upon the Joint Committee on Taxation, which was just alluded to, and where they find the benefits of the tax relief going. As you can see from this chart, these represent different income groups, and the highest percentage tax cuts actually go to those in the lower and middle income groups. So if you look at who benefits from this, every income group gets a significant tax cut. But middle income Americans uh, do particularly well percentage wise uh, under this tax reform proposal. So the argument, again, that this is somehow simply a you know, tax cut for the rich just doesn't pass the smell test. It doesn't comport with reality. Clearly, uh, the numbers tell a very different story. Uh, the other point I'd like to make, Mr. President, is that if you look at what we tried to accomplish in this, the design of this tax bill, we tried to maintain the existing progressivity in the tax code. We have one of the most progressive tax codes in the world. We have a lot of people in this country who don't have any income tax liability, some whom benefit from refundable tax credits that helps uh, eliminate or partially eliminate their payroll tax liability as well. But this chart shows you, under our bill, when it's all said and done, who bears the tax burden in this country. In other words, the percentage of the tax liability uh, paid by each different group of, uh, in, in different income groups. So if you look at this, you can see those in the twenty dollars to $50,000 range, this is, again, their tax burden as a percentage of the entire tax burden levied on Americans uh, around the country, the rate drops from 4.3% to 4.1%. So those in the $20,000 to $50,000 income group, as a percentage tax burden in the country, pay less under our proposal than they do today. If you look at the group from $50,000 to $100,000, that income group, they also, as a percentage of the entire tax burden borne by Americans, pay less under our proposal than they do day, today. They pay 16.9% today. Under our proposal, they will pay 16.7% of total taxes in this country. Those, on the other hand, making $100,000 or more will play, pay slightly more of the overall tax burden. Today, they pay 78.7%. Under our proposal, they'll pay 78.9%. So people under $100,000 are going to be paying less as a share of the overall tax burden than they currently do today. I don't know how anyone with a straight face can argue that somehow this is a tax bill that benefits those in the upper end. With respect to the arguments that are being made right now, Mr. President, regarding the joint uh, committee uh, release of the dynamic score, uh, I would say the same thing that my colleague from Texas did, and I think the, the good news in all this is what it demonstrates is what we're trying to do here actually generates economic growth. It actually generates additional revenue for the tre Federal Treasury. Now, we can argue about how much. We happen to think that the assumptions used by the Joint Committee are not accurate because they assume that we're going to continue to grow for the next decade, our economy, at 1.9 percent. 1.9 percent. Historical averages, going back to the end of World War II, in the American economy, we have averaged somewhere between three and three and a half percent growth. And so if you take the assumption that we're never going to do any better than 1.9 percent growth in the economy, then perhaps their uh, estimate could be accurate. We happen to believe we're going to do a whole lot better than that. And we believe that if we put the right policies in place and we make America an attractive place in which to invest, that we're going to see considerably higher growth than 1.9 percent. So what does it take to cover the number that we created in this tax bill that would have to be uh, paid for 
with additional growth in the economy. Well, it takes about four-tenths of one percent of growth, increase in average annual growth over the next decade. So what does that mean? Well, that means instead of growing at 1.9 percent a year for the next decade, we're going to have to grow at 2.2, 2.3 percent, somewhere in that ballpark in order to not only cover this, but actually start generating revenue above and beyond what the, uh, the impact of the tax cut would be on the, on the federal budget. And so what I would simply say to my colleagues, Mr. President, is when you look at these various um, models that are done and the assumptions that are made, remember that the Joint Committee on Taxation, the Congressional Budget Office, the numbers that they're using, assume 1.9 percent economic growth. I mean, I can't believe that we wouldn't have more confidence in the American economy that we could generate higher than 1.9 percent economic growth. That is the straitjacket that constrains their models. Now, there are other models out there that have looked at this same information, the same data, looked at the same tax bill, considered the behavioral effects of that and how it would impact the economy and come to an entirely different conclusion. In fact, uh, the Tax Foundation has suggested that the tax bill that we have in front of us today would generate an additional $1.26 trillion in revenue over that same time period because of the additional growth that would come with it. And so what we tried to do is design a tax bill that not only delivers meaningful tax relief to middle-income families, which I think, as I just showed with the two charts, uh, demonstrates that we do, but secondly, to put policies in place that will create conditions that are favorable to economic growth so that we can get growth back up to a more historic level. When the economy is growing at a faster rate, it means that companies, are, businesses are creating jobs, better paying jobs, and if there's a competition for labor in this country, and I believe there will be, when companies start to expand, start to grow their operations, it increases the demand for labor, the price for labor goes up, and wages go up. And that's what we want to see. And that's the other thing about this bill that doesn't get talked about enough. The reduction in rates on businesses means that they have more to invest in their businesses, and one of the byproducts of that is it goes into higher wages for their employees. Now, the uh, President's Council of Economic Advisors suggests that that impact would be about $4,000 a year in additional income per average household in this country. There's another study done by uh, Boston University where they concluded that it would result in $3,500 a year in additional income per household in this country. So the impact of the tax cuts are really twofold. One is you American families are going to have more in their pockets. Why? Because we double the standard deduction. In our bill, we double the child tax credit. We lower rates, all of which impact lower and middle income families in this country. Those are all features they can take advantage of, which generate additional benefits to them. Benefits which, by the way, if you're an average family in this country, typical family of four with a combined annual income of $73,000, results in a $2,200 tax cut. That's a 60% tax cut over what they would pay under current law. So that's $2,200 in that family's pocket that they'll be able to spend on themselves and their families instead of sending that to Washington, D.C. and having somebody decide how to spend it out here. Now, we happen to have a lot of confidence that the American people are better prepared and better equipped to decide how to spend their own money than the federal government is. So that's a direct benefit, number one. Secondly, as I said earlier, if you get the benefit not only of the tax cut that comes to middle-income families, but also the additional growth in the economy that generates better paying jobs, that generates higher wages, that increases your overall household income. That is how American families benefit directly from the legislation that we're considering today. Uh, my colleague from Ohio is here. He pays a lot of attention to what, ha what the economic trends are. And I think it's interesting to note that the Congressional Budget Office and the Joint Tax Committee, which in their analysis assume 1.9 percent growth in the economy for the next decade, we think we can do a lot better. And I would ask my colleague from Ohio, uh, aren't we already starting to do better economically? Uh, I think we've seen a significant improvement in growth in the economy just in the last couple of quarters. And if we would continue to stay on that track or a similar track, which I think this tax reform legislation helps enable, uh, we might be able to get to a point where we're growing at a more historic rate. What was the growth rate, just for example, in the last couple of quarters that we've seen in this country? I think you make a great point, and we've had a debate here this afternoon about economic growth, and one of the uh, realities now uh, on both sides of the aisle, we agree that the tax relief that we're putting out there, which is 
helping middle class families to be able to have a little healthier family budget, uh, but also helping workers with regard to the international competition. Right now, our workers are competing with one hand tied behind their back. Uh, that all this is going to generate more economic growth. It's going to come from more investment, more productivity. And uh, in fact, the number that the Joint Committee on Taxation put out today, although it's uh, significantly lower than other numbers, uh, you know, is over $400 billion in more revenue coming in. So enough growth that it will generate that much more revenue coming into the federal government. And that's based upon an assumption that the growth rate in the economy for the next decade is going to be 1.9%. Exactly. But so, so that's, that's the number. Let's, let's say roughly $400 billion that they have. By the way, there are 137 economists who tell us that uh, it will be not $400 billion, but it will be a trillion dollars. And this is their quote. Uh, they, their letter came out yesterday. It said, economic growth will accelerate if the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passes, leading to more jobs, higher wages, better standard of living for the American people. This is 137 economists who say, actually, it, it's going to be more than twice as much as joint tax says. And there are other studies. You've talked about some of them that indicate there'll be even more economic growth. But and we're already seeing that, right? I mean, and we, and we're already, already seeing it pick up. So, so that's that's one part of the debate: is how much economic growth is going to come out of these tax reforms that we're putting forward. Uh, we know it'll be a lot. The question is, is how much? But this is all based on a. Congressional Budget Office estimate of growth over the next 10 years, the GDP growth, the economic growth. So we're sort of in a straitjacket that although we believe this tax reform proposal will help in terms of that growth, uh, we have to go by this number of 1.9 percent. And 1.9 percent um, is anemic growth. I mean, that's sad. <laughs> if we can't do better than 1.9 percent, we've got real problems in this country. And that's for the next 10 years projected. As you have said, it's kind of interesting. They're projecting 1.9 percent. Others are projecting higher numbers. Uh, in the context of us just having finished a quarter that was 3.3 percent, it was adjusted yesterday to 3.3 percent. And then the quarter before, the second quarter this year, 3 percent. So 3 percent, 3.3 percent the last two quarters, and yet they're saying 1.9 percent. Now, uh, again, there's others out there. There's a private forecast I saw earlier this week that indicates between 3 and 4 percent growth next year. Uh, the average, as you said, since World War II is far higher. Even the last 30 years with a lot of recessions and hurricanes and other natural disasters, it's 2.5 percent or more. So this is not normal. In other words, this is a relatively low rate. And I, I, I know we can do better. I don't, I don't say, uh, as some do, that this is somehow the new normal. We've got to do better. If we don't do better, we can't begin to get wages back up again, which have been flat really for the past couple of decades when you take inflation into account. We know we can do better. And that's one reason this tax reform is so important, to give the economy that shot in the arm. But let's assume for a minute that it will only be 1.9 percent growth, dismal growth. Let's assume this tax proposal passes. Uh, let's assume we get the benefit from the increased revenue in that. And by the way, what we say in the tax reform proposal is about $1.4 to $1.5 trillion of tax relief will be a part of this. That's out of 44 trillion dollars over the next 10 years that will come in revenue. We're saying, let's have a little bit of a tax relief because we know that the growth will make up for that. So let's assume that this is true. Let's assume you use the right policy baseline, assuming that we're going to continue with the current extenders, which we always do. We end up, and stick with me here, with about $533 billion deficit over the next 10 years if you assume this really low rate of growth. If you assume that instead of 1.9 percent, we go not to 3 percent, not to 2.5 percent, not even to 2.4, 2.3, 2.2, but let's just say 2.1 percent growth. Again, very conservative, and I sure hope we're going to do better than that. I believe we will. But let's assume it's 2.1 percent. That will generate enough revenue because it's roughly $270 billion per every 0.1 percent to have this tax reform proposal actually result in money going back into the Treasury, in other words, reducing the deficit. So I think this is very fiscally responsible. I think it is very conservative. Uh, I think 2.1 percent growth is not something that uh, is at all out of bounds. In fact, I think it's going to be far higher than that based on the growth we've already had recently and the growth that's projected in the future by outside forecasters. So I would just say to folks who are hearing about this somehow blowing a hole in the deficit, I think just the opposite. I think it's going to actually 
result in more money going into the federal treasuries to be able to get the deficit down. And, and let me say something else, and I think this is a, you know, this is a, a debate we can have, but we've got to deal with the growth side if we're going to get the debt and deficit under control. There's no question about it. It can't just be done on the spending side. We've got to get this economic growth going. But even to do the important work we have to do on a bipartisan basis to restrain growth, it's much more likely we do it when we have higher growth. If we're at 1.9 percent, we're not going to get there. So let's do some pro-growth tax reform. Let's get this economy moving. Let's give people the sense that we can tackle these problems. Let's do something about the debt and deficit. And we can do that, again, by very meager growth, 2.1 percent versus 1.9 percent, and actually take money that is currently uh, in the economy at 1.9 percent, not moving much. Let's get it moving more. Let's create more economic activity. Let's do that to get that growth rate up a little bit through this tax reform, and then let's actually begin to reduce that debt and deficit. So I just wanted to make that point. When you hear about uh, this is somehow fiscally irresponsible, I think it's very responsible fiscally, very conservative. I think we'll do better than the numbers that we've seen here, 1.9 percent growth, certainly just 2.1 percent growth that actually reduces the deficit. And I think that ought to be brought into the debate here. And, and to our, our colleagues, and I count myself, and I'm sure uh, the senator from Ohio uh, as well, among those of us who consider ourselves fiscal conservatives, realize that in order to deal with debt and deficits, yes, you've got, we've got to get uh, our arms around out of control Washington spending. And, um, and we've got to do something to make those programs that are driving that out of control spending more sustainable in the long run. We've got to, get, we've got to, we've got to do uh, the other side of this, which is to restrain spending. But in order to deal with debt and deficits, we really need that growth in the economy. Because higher growth, the economy is growing at a faster rate. It means people are working, people are paying taxes, people are taking realizations in paying taxes, and government revenues go up All time for dramatically. debate has expired. And so we need growth, and that's what this bill will accomplish. And Mr. President, uh, you'll yield back the balance of my time.